dear friends, distinguished guests. Let's consider what I'm going to say now as an attempt to reflect upon the process of what happened yesterday and is going to unfold today. First, everything can change overnight. Ours are times when everything can change overnight. Either we commit ourselves to that change for the better, locate our identity in the future, and fight to become its cause, or we are finished as a, hum as a human culture. There is no third way because the present world is a living dead. The consequence of its submission to the British imperial monetarist law is trumpeted, as Lynn said yesterday, at the highest level of the British system. A reduction of human population from the present seven billion people to slightly more than one billion or even less. It means a policy of mass killings, either by an organized extinction or by a thermonuclear war. The conditions to produce the foodstuffs required by even our present population, not to speak about the more than nine billion human beings allegedly expected for 2050. These conditions are not met. The conditions for energy production are not met. The conditions for scientific discoveries and technological improvements are not met. The conclusion is tragically obvious. Nobody informed could say they did not know where the present policies lead. It is like at the Nuremberg Tribunal, knew it or should have known. And there is no excuse. However, Europeans' head of states are behaving like servants of the time bomb. They react with sophism, compromises, to the murderous conditions created in Greece, in Cyprus, in Portugal, Spain, Italy, and soon to be France and Germany itself. Their policies spread murder because their mind are occupied by a culture of death. Look at the spread of tuberculosis and malaria in Greece. Look at the Greek kids, as it was said yesterday, scrambling into garbage cans. And this winter, adults cutting trees in private gardens, in public parks, along the streets, to get wood to avoid freezing. Look at the masses of Spanish people thrown out of their homes, people dying because there is no medicine in Greece, Cyprus, Portugal, and Spain. And look also at the increase of the rate of suicides, not only there, but in Italy and in France. There are presently French workers setting fire to themselves, not only unemployed, but also broken down by unbearable working conditions. It is not only in some remote country, it is coming to us, us as a whole, here and now. Even to Germany, which remains a safe heaven only for the desperate delusions of the humble and the offended of the South. If we would only consider such conditions, taking such conditions as a reference point, the future of Europe in Eurasian cooperation would be nothing but the transmission of a venereal disease. This is the immediate reason why a paradigm change is not only necessary, but mandatory. The future of Europe is in Eurasian cooperation, provided we change our way of thinking and acting. To think about it as some economic decision within the present system would be not only dishonest, but idiotic. The truth is, first, 
that there could be no European recovery without the development of the Mediterranean and Africa. And there could not be that development without the development of Eurasia as a whole. And there could not be, in turn, the development of Eurasia without the development of a world land bridge. It is not a question of interlinked logics, it's a question of political necessity. Our enemy operating at a world scale, we have also to operate at a world scale from top down. There could not be today a solution to a partial cause without rising to the cause of the causes. In other terms, for a European future in an Eurasian cooperation, we have to help the change on top, which means at the level of the United States. At present, both the United States and Europe are occupied countries at a whole transatlantic scale. And the fight to free ourselves from the shackles of that occupation should be and has to be transatlantic. There is absolutely no way that Europe or any European country can faradasse, do it by herself. It cannot be. This doesn't mean that European countries should wait to be freed by some uprising in the United States. It means that we have to think of ourselves, human individuals, as a link between Eurasia and the United States to help that uprising in the United States to happen as soon as possible. This is a starting point for the future of Europe in Eurasia, which necessarily lies in the United States. The second truth is that we have to identify the real nature of the enemy, the British Empire. It is not British as a matter of nationality. It is British as a matter of empire, the empire of the animal kingdom, as Lyndon LaRouche puts it. It treats human beings like beasts and promotes for that cause the worst drug in human beings, the drug of money and gambling. It imprisons them within the empire of money and the compulsion to gamble, to be fascinated in a morbid game, to come on top at the expense of all others, the exact opposite of the advantage of the other, which was the basis for the creation of the nation state at the Peace of Westphalia. The empire is organized both to destroy the individual sovereignty of human beings and the sovereignty of nation states. We are now at its end phase. After the murders of Kennedy brothers, of the Kennedy brothers and of Martin Luther King, it spread to unprecedented amounts in world history, both fictitious capital and fictitious pseudo goods. By pseudo goods, I mean goods produced for an early collapse to compel people to buy again to replace them, thanks to credit made available by the banks without any technological development of the economy in the process. Now we have reached a point at which the pyramids of debts and credit can only be maintained by hyperinflation, the bailout, and the looting of people's assets, the Berlin, deposits in the banks. This is no more capitalism because the respect of private property is thrown to the wolves. It's no more capitalism. Not even financial capitalism, because the system continues to buy people with credit and crap goods. It has become a financial fascism based on the looting of all except those protected by an electrified financial and law enforcement ring fence. And that's what is the British oligarchy promoting right now before our noses. It is on the basis of fighting against this enemy, which is nothing more than the modernized version of the old Roman Empire, that the common future of Europe and Eurasia is located. The crucial role of the United States lies not only, as people sometimes are mistaken in Europe, 
lies not only in its physical power, but on the power of its constitution, what LaRouche stressed yesterday. It's a Hamiltonian constitution explicitly based against the British Empire, the oligarchic system of predators. It is based on the fact that the existence of the human species lies outside the bounds defined by the animal kingdom. Therefore, the American Constitution is based on the future conditions to be created for the common good of all, and not on an extrapolation or deduction of given present conditions. It is a bet on the future, not a bet on futures prices in some financial market. This requires the existence of a national banking entity securing credit, public credit, to build that future, reimbursed by the payback of the development created by the related investments. This is, in simple terms, the principle of Hamiltonian economics as a law of the American Constitution, issuance of credit for the capacity of human beings to create in the physical universe and not to bet on the markets. The starting point, again, is what LaRouche defines as the foremost distinction of human life from all other forms of life, the human species' power to effect willful increase in the quality of the energy flux densities, which, in the case of the human species, is a systematically functional distinction of the qualitative leaps upwards into willfully chosen higher orders of magnitude of energy flux density. This is a very important issue of progress, which is not an indefinite extension of what already exists. It's not basically quantitative, but it is to create the conditions for those qualitative leaps toward the future. Not pseudo goods at a relatively fixed stage of technology and traded with funny money, but set of new products based on the application of new scientific principles. And it is precisely what the oligarchy of the empire wants to prevent at any costs, because it raises a question of the necessity of human freedom to create. Without human freedom, there is no creation. The oligarchy wants to manage a fixed universe in space and time. And when the conditions of the fixity of its power, the conditions of its control, are not met, it destroys more and more, like the Roman Empire of yesterday and the British Empire of today. Money then, which under normal conditions is an idiot, becomes a criminal. That's why to be something useful for the future of Eurasia, our European countries and people have to understand the issue of change in the United States. This means the combined effect of the Glass-Steagall principle and a public credit system, the explicit and implicit basis for the American Constitution that were applied in the United States under Franklin Delano Roosevelt <clears throat> and also in Europe for the reconstruction after World War II. Since the death of Roosevelt and the murder of John Kennedy, this principle of the Constitution has been betrayed in the United States and replaced by the British monetary system. In Europe, Worse, our head of states have become the lackeys of that British system and the enemies of their own states. To recover the Constitution in the United States, where this reference of principle exists, do exist, is therefore the issue for Europe and Eurasia. It means first Glass-Steagall, originating in America and the United States, and then spread to the whole world as a global Glass-Steagall. It is not a mere separation of commercial banks and investment banks. It is an anti-monetary principle. It is a principle to stop the inflationary looting. The banks that have betted on the markets will be left to their own without bailout or bail-ins. And therefore, they would become officially bankrupt. They are already living dead. Glass-Steagall will be their death certificate. And for us, 
for us all the liberation from the murderous pollution. That's the true pollution. All the European heads of state may expect it, or some would expect it, but they have not the courage to face the British Empire, as exemplified by the fake banking reform in France. They are historically so much plunged into this system, into its system, the system of the British Empire, that even those that are not outright accomplices are like rabbits caught in the, light, in the lights of a coming truck. They are paralyzed by their fear. Therefore, our initial fight for the future of Europe in Eurasia is to push for the Glass-Steagall principle where we can win in the United States and then to adopt it in Europe as a reverse of the post-World War II reconstruction, to be the basis of a common European Eurasian recovery from the Atlantic to the Sea of China. This means to make known and spread the fight of the friends of Lyndon LaRouche, both in Europe and in Eurasia. That's our task, to make their organizing known here. And that's why they are here, why Diane Sayer is here, among us today. <laughs> because we need them. We need them as an inspiring motion, an essential leverage to give us courage to free ourselves from what we have allowed ourselves to become. The positive complement to the glass -Steagall is a public credit system. Once the grounds are cleaned up for the Ogias stables are cleaned up, we need an engine to build our future. This is again the notion of the Hamiltonian public credit based on a national banking principle, not allowing the oligarchy to seize the state privilege to issue currency. The reimbursement of the credit is provided by the accomplishments that that credit has generated. Our publications have shown what could be done with it even at the present level of technologies. The Eurasian land bridge, an economic miracle for the Mediterranean region and Africa, a World New Deal, as stated in our Kidridge Resolution of September 16, 2007. My purpose here is not to enter into the different aspects of those projects, but to show what we are missing by not launching them. At this point, what we are truly missing is the future of humanity. Indeed, the Euro system prevents that creation of a credit system. It has been created to prevent the creation of that system and promotes austerity for the people, meaning now the policy of mass murder for the people and safe heavens for the ring fence principalities and powers. That's the main reason why the Euro system has to be dumped, not as a single monetary issue, but as a monstrous system created to destroy the physical economy, an intrinsically evil system, not a honest failure, as Mr. Luke may believe wrongly and stupidly. Our projects, to say it in one word, mean instead to open the gates of the global concentration camps that are now established by the oligarchy of the British Empire and its allies. Look at Greece, Portugal, Spain, and look instead at our projects. It is the difference between life and death, not the difference between two available programs. Arrived at this point in our present Europe, I meet a lot of people who say, yes, yes, you're right, you're right, but it's not possible to go there. It is utopian. It is too beautiful to be true. It is too beautiful to be done. This suicidal European pessimism is our worst enemy and the best induced weapon of the British oligarchy. At a moment of decision, 
between self-destruction and a better future, the perfectibilitas humanitatis. What is here and now at stake is the understanding and the capacity of the human mind to master and improve the future and to rationally believe that an improvement is possible and not only possible, but necessary. At this point, to give a sense of what Europe can bring to Eurasia as a gift to our common destiny, I am convinced that it is more than legitimate to bring in the example of somebody that fought in a similar moment of change, a similar moment of change like ours, between the Middle Ages and the modern times, the man of the Renaissance after the Great Plague, the Black Death of the 14th century, and during the Hundred Years' War of the 15th century, Cardinal Nicolaus Cusa. He is one of the greatest thinkers of human history, but do not imagine him settled in some monastery thinking. He was engaged in the public life of his times, and we don't say that enough, many times at the risk of his life, and had to reform the religious organization in a region of Europe going from Switzerland to Hamburg and from Louvain in Belgium to Magdeburg, a sizable, a sizable portion of Eurasia. He was twice imprisoned in the fortress of Andratz and had to abandon everything he owned. It is in, in 1438, when he was accompanying the theologians from Constantinople to the Council of Florence, that he conceived the concept at the center of all his theology and philosophy, the coincidencia oppositorum, the coincidence of the opposed. This concept is crucial for world history, and in particular, for our decisive moment here and now, like it was in Florence in 1439, because it defines how from above, from the top down, ideas or forces that seem and are in contradiction at a certain level can coincide at a higher level after a leap beyond any established conjunctions or disjunctions. These leaps correspond exactly to the leaps, to the qualitative leaps upwards that a public credit system has a mandate to promote and also it was the basis for the dialogue of religions that Cusa later elaborated in his De Pace Fidei, the common pretest, the common pregustatio of truth in the quest for unity. Europe, Eurasia, today. What is so revolutionary about it is that the concept of coincidencia oppositorum, which locates truth in the motion to know and to improve beyond the apparent circumstances, is in absolute opposition to the principle of non-contradiction of the then prevalent Aristotelian cult. The principle of non-contradiction operates in a world of fixed formal logics of controlled rituals, preventing the mind to reach a level of intellectual imagination to discover new principles in the splendor of truth. There you have it, the world of the oligarchy is the Aristotelian world of a finished, fixed nature opposed to the discovery of new physical principles and opposed to change. It can't be done. It's too beautiful to be true. It's not possible. It's even impossible. This is precisely the world of the European, the world of the European and transatlantic oligarchy today, once again. And Cusa gives us a key to get out of it. In his times, after discussions with his friend Toscanelli, he conceived the solution as an escape from the grip of the European oligarchy in an outreach towards a new found land. This mission, conveyed to Columbus first and to the Mayflower later, gave birth to the American principle of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, the America of the Mathers, of Hamilton, Lincoln, and Roosevelt, based on the rising of humanity through the transformation of man and nature for the common good, the general welfare principle, 
and the service for future generations. This is beyond the population and the territory. This is America as a principle, a human creativity system. This is what it is. It doesn't exist today in the present organization of the American presidency, but it does exist as a principle there, and our task is to make it happen and to organize its rebirth. Our task today is that this process of becoming associated to the discovery and creation of the United States continues with the development of Eurasia and beyond with a space policy beginning with a planetary defense. It is a condition for the human mind to maintain its integrity. Daydreaming, daydreaming we hear in Europe. Some would say, and some would scream from their position in the low valley, in the low frozen valley of Aristotelianism. It's impossible, it's impossible. The blindness mistakes daydreaming for an experience in thinking, for a Gedanken experiment. They have no sense of what it is. Daydreaming, well, the answer is that the same Kusa who elaborated these philosophical and theological conceptions is the one who, in the first, in the first dialogue of his idiota, the Statistis Experimentis, elaborated the principles of all modern mechanics and medicine through his conception of knowing through waving, the weight being the reflection of a higher reality, waving of human weight, respiration, breath, urine, according to the edges, to measure the overall physical condition through such reflections. And also, by the same token, conceiving in the same way, in the same trust, music, astronomical and meteorological instruments, hygrometers, barometers, and uh, also soundings. The point here is that it was a philosopher who established the principle of a perfect balance capable to correct the imperfection of the human senses. It is that philosopher who let out the basis of mechanical science and not an Aristotelian obsessed by mechanical relations between objects. I want now to put it in another way related to yesterday's discussion on energy. It is to understand energy and power as two opposed species. The Aristotelian oligarchical concept is that of energy. It is linear, it takes into account the units produced, and then it takes the quantity and establish an addition of the units, independently of the creative process. It is meat for academic asses, a mathematical dead end. The anti-Aristotelian, Cousin or Leibnizian conception is that of power. It measures the progression of flux density according to the process of production corresponding to the level of the productive powers of labor per capita and per square kilometer. It is, it is not meat, it is matter for creative minds. It means future reached through progress. Progress, progress, as LaRouche said yesterday. It means fusion, and it means fusion as a way to Mars. I must add, that it is El Gazep LaRouche, as an expert in the creative commitment of Cusa, who conceived the Eurasian land bridge principle, and not an assembly of learned asses muzzled to the trough of their formal expertise and satisfied with the fodder provided by the academies. It was her. Cusa himself makes a very interesting point in expressing his optimism about mind, about the human mind, in his hunt for wisdom, his before last work. Since 
I have now read in Diogenes Laertius' book on the life of the philosophers about the various hunts for wisdom of the philosophers, I was impelled to devote my mind to this so pleasing speculation than which nothing more delightful can occur to man. And he concludes, therefore, I believe I have unfolded the rough and not completely purified concept of my hunts, venatione sapiense, as far as it was possible to me, and now submit everything to him who is better able to contemplate these lofty things. Him, who is he? We. That's we. There, there we are. There we are. Challenged to hunt for wisdom, challenged to progress, to improve, and make it the impossible possible, which is the most joyful thing that can be accomplished because it is the most human. Glass-Steagall, a public credit policy, the Eurasian and World Land Bridges, a policy of the Earth defense policy, this should be the European philosophy unfolding in the process of an active, compassionate hunting. It should be our common European Eurasian policy to get humanity out of the pit. As I said before, now everything can change overnight, and it depends upon us that it is for the good and not for what the British have prepared before us, a terrestrial hell. Thank you. <laughs>